Welcome back. Today we will discuss the flow through pipes. Flow through pipes is one of the most common applications in industry. Almost all process industries that include chemical industries, pharmaceutical industries involve some reactors in which fluids are moving in and moving out. The fluids are supplied through pipes. So, we need to worry about the flow rates, we need to worry about the pumping power required. The first reported experiments connected with the flow of pipes are due to Reynolds that we have discussed earlier. Reynolds, a British scientist, conducted experiments on a glass tube submerged in water through which the fluid that is water flowed through and the rate of flow was controlled by a valve. To study the behavior of the fluid, Reynolds injected a dye at the center of the tube. The dye came on as a streak and he studied how that streak behaved as the time passed on. These are the sketches from the first paper of Reynolds. He found out that when the speed of flow was low, the streak appeared as a smooth filament and went down the tube. As the flow speed increased, the streak started diffusing outwards and for larger speed, the streak became turbulent. So, he concluded that low speeds, the flow through a pipe is laminar and is turbulent at high speeds. These are some recent pictures, relatively recent pictures of the flow through the same equipment. Here, this first picture is at a low speed, then as the speed increased, the streak of dye started changing character and by this speed, there was no longer a smooth streak, but largely dispersed dye. This transition from laminar to turbulent is interesting. While laminar flows are dominated by viscous forces, turbulent flows are dominated by inertial forces associated with large scale mixing of the fluid. It stands to reason that in geometrically similar situations, the transition from laminar to turbulent flow should occur at a fixed ratio of inertial and viscous forces. Since the Reynolds number measures this ratio, the transition should be marked by a fixed value of the Reynolds number, which is defined as rho V average D, the diameter of the tube, divided by the viscosity of the liquid. The value of Reynolds number at which the transition from laminar to turbulent flow takes place is called the critical Reynolds number, RECR. When the Reynolds number is below 2300, the flow is always laminar and any disturbances in the flow is quickly damped out. However, when Reynolds numbers increase, the flow may or may not be turbulent depending on the conditions at the inlet and the levels of vibration in the experimental setup. Johnson and Loeb did the experiment in 1983 on the same equipment as Reynolds used 
in his laboratory at the University of Manchester. Reynolds had reported that the transition took place at Reynolds number as high as 100,000. But in the later experiment, a century later, they could never take the transition beyond about 8,000. And that was largely because the roads near the laboratory in University of Manchester are now busy roads with a lot of traffic. The traffic causes disturbance in the building and because of the vibrational environment around the laboratory, the transition now takes place earlier. If great care is taken in making the pipe walls very smooth and in suppressing the turbulence in the incoming fluid and in isolating the experimental setup from external vibrations, the transition can be delayed to as high a Reynolds number as 100,000. But for most engineering applications, a value of 2300 represents a good choice for the critical Reynolds number. We had earlier discussed the flow at the entrance of a pipe. When the flow enters a pipe with uniform velocity across a section, soon the viscous action at the wall takes over and slows the fluid down at the wall. So the flat velocity profile at the entrance changes into velocity profile where the velocity is zero at the wall by no slip condition, but the velocity is uniform in the center. As the flow proceeds down the tube, more and more of the flow area is affected by the viscosity till at this location all of the area is now affected by viscosity. Beyond that, the profile does not change. This is the region over which we say that the flow is developing. And beyond this is what is termed as the fully developed flow. How long is the developing flow region? Again, this region should depend upon the inertial and the viscous forces. So, this should depend only on the Reynolds number. The length over which the flow is developing is termed as the entrance length and it increases with the Reynolds number. One commonly used correlation for entrance length for laminar flows is Le is equal to 0 0.06 Reynolds number based on the diameter of the pipe or the tube. While in the turbulent flows, this correlation is Le is equal to 4.4 into Red raised to power 1 sixth. The entrance length in turbulent flows is much smaller than those in laminar flows. Consider for example a flow at Reynolds number 2400. In this value, the flow could be laminar as well as turbulent depending upon other conditions. If the flow is laminar, Reynolds number is 2400. So, the entrance length is 0 0.006 times the Reynolds number which gives, to, gives us 144 diameters. But if the flow is turbulent, this entrance length is only 16 diameter. Thus, the entrance effect is negligible more often in turbulent flows than in laminar flows. But as you remember, most commercial flows 
are turbulent. So, the entrance effect can be neglected in many situations. This illustrates the difference in the profile through a laminar flow and in a turbulent flow. The flow profile in laminar flows is parabolic with mean velocity one half of the maximum velocity, while the velocity profile in turbulent flows is quite flat at the center. It is much sharper at the walls and because of this there are larger shear stresses on the wall than in the case of laminar flows. And because of this, there are much larger pressure drops, much shorter developing lengths as we discussed and then we know the most flows are turbulent. Water flowing in a 10 centimeter diameter tube at a speed 20 centimeters per second is likely to be turbulent. A few lectures ago, we obtained the laminar velocity profile for fully developed flow in a pipe. We considered an annular control volume. In this element, we wrote the forces, the pressure forces and the shear forces. Because of full development, these two forces should be balancing, there should be no net force and the force balance gave us this relation for W, loop, the velocity component in the z direction. We showed that P prime is constant, that is there is a linear pressure gradient down the pipe. From this we obtained the velocity profile and the velocity profile is parabolic in R, capital R is the radius of the tube. This velocity profile and on integrating this we found out the flow and then from the flow we found out the average velocity which was minus p prime r square by 8 mu. The volume flow rate was determined as pi r is to power 4 divided by 8 mu into minus p prime. This is known as Hagen Poisson law and depends upon two conditions. The flow is laminar and it is fully developed that the length of the pipe is much larger than the entrance length so that the entrance length the end effect can be neglected. This is for laminar flows, but laminar flows are few. So, we need pressure drop relations for turbulent flows. Since the analytical solution for this problem is not available, we resort to experimentally developed correlations for the purpose. Since the pressure drop depends on several parameters, namely the density and viscosity among the fluid properties and the length, diameter and the roughness of the pipe wall, we need to develop pi numbers to reduce the number of independent parameters in the problem using the techniques that we learned in last few lectures. So, what is our problem now? Given a pipe of length L and diameter D, find out the total pressure drop in the pipe when the fluid of density rho and viscosity mu flows through this at, at a given volume flow rate. There are two forces that are important, the pressure forces and the viscous forces and in addition we write the inertial forces. 
So we develop the scale factor for all of these three type of forces and equate them since there should be only one force vector and from this we obtain two pi numbers. We have Kfi for the initial force which should be Km times Ka where m is the mass and a is acceleration. Mass is like rho times volume. So, k mass is k rho times k l cube and k a as we have done a number of times earlier is k v square by k l. So, this gives us k f i is equal to k rho k v square k l square. And from this we get a pi number f inertial force divided by rho v square l square. Similarly, we develop the pi number for the viscous force and pi number for the viscous force is obtained as f mu the viscous force divided by mu v L, the same pi number that we obtained in the last class. The third pi number we deal with is the pressure force, which is pressure into area. For pressure or rather pressure difference, we have k delta p and for area we have k l square. And so, k f for the pressure force is k delta p times k l square or pi is equal to f p divided by delta p l square. Notice that we have converted p into script p which is the non gravitational pressure discussed earlier. These three scale factors must be equal. From these we get two pi numbers, the Reynolds number rho v l by mu. It is assumed that all values are characteristic. The Euler number delta p divided by one half rho v square. One half is there because of convention. This assumes geometric similarity between the flows. The length L of the pipe and its diameter D are the obvious geometrical parameters. In the addition, a French engineer by the name M. Darcy showed experimentally in 1857 that the pressure drop in turbulent flows is also affected by the roughness of the pipe wall. The wall roughness may be characterized by the mean height epsilon of the roughness elements on the wall. And therefore, the non dimensional geometric parameters are L by LC. LC is the characteristic length, L is the length of pipe. So, L, D, and epsilon are the three geometric parameters. So, we get three non dimensional geometric parameters L by LC, D by LC and epsilon by LC. We still have to choose what LC we use. We can then write any non dimensional dependent parameters like pressure drop as a function of Reynolds number, Euler number and these geometric parameters. The most common problems encountered in, in pi flows is to evaluate the piezometric pressure drop delta p for a given flow rate. The non dimensional piezometric pressure drop is delta p divided by delta p characteristic can then be written as a function of Reynolds number, Euler number, L by L c, D by L c and epsilon by L c. It is convenient to use diameter of the pipe as the 
characteristic length in these problems. And we use the average velocity of the fluid through the pipe as the characteristic velocity. There is no characteristic difference in the pressure in the independent parameters and so we can choose this it arbitrarily. If we choose the characteristic pressure difference delta p as one half rho v average square, the value of delta p divided by one half rho v square is rendered as unity a constant and so it drops out from the functional relations. If we treat delta p as in as dependent per parameter, then the functional relation becomes delta p divided by one half rho v average square is a function of Reynolds number L by d and epsilon by d. We can find the pi numbers by dimensional analysis also. The dimensional analysis was introduced in the last lecture. We start with the list of parameters. The basic group as we defined there are rho d v average. The independent parameters which contain all the dimensions involved. There are three dimensions involved m, l and t here and so we choose three independent parameters as the basic group and rho d v average involve all these three dimensions and do not form any non-dimensional parameter amongst themselves. The other independent parameter which are not in the basic group are mu viscosity, length L of the pipe and epsilon the mean roughness height. And we write one dependent parameter in this case it is delta p, the piezometric pressure drop. We write the dimensions of all these parameters. So, then we form for other parameters and variables that is this group. We take one of these and multiply them by rho raised to power a, l raised to power b and v average raised to power c and then determine the values a, b and c which will make this non-dimensional. If we use viscosity, we get a parameter mu divided by rho v average d as non-dimensional pi number. The inverse of this is the Reynolds number. With L, you get L by d as a non-dimensional parameter with epsilon you get epsilon by d as a non-dimensional parameter. With delta p the dependent parameter we get delta p divided by rho average v square as the dependent non-dimensional parameter pi 4. So, we can write the equation just like before delta p over one half rho v average square is a function of Reynolds number L by d and epsilon by t. Now, if the pipe is very long compared to the entrance length L e, we may assume that the flow is fully developed along the entire length of the pipe. Then we can apply the Hagen Poisson law all along the pipe length and so the pressure gradient is constant in the pipe. If pressure gradient is constant in the pipe, then delta p should increase linearly with L. And so, we can write delta p one half rho v average square is L by d, the length parameter non-dimensional is taken out linear delta p is linear with L. So, it can be written as L by d times a function of Reynolds number and epsilon by d. The dimensionless function 
of Reynolds number in the epsilon by d is termed as the Darcy friction factor and is denoted by f, lowercase f. So, in terms of f, the pressure gradient parameter delta p divided by 1 half rho v average square is simply f into L by d. Or in terms of the head loss, we can write head loss h L is which is delta p by rho g is nothing but f times v average square divided by 2 g into L by d. For laminar no flow region, we know v average is minus p prime r square by 8 mu. And if we cast this in the form of f, we get f is equal to 64 by r e. So, in the laminar flow region, the friction factor, the Darcy friction factor f varies like 64 by r e. Many researchers at the beginning of the 20th century did extensive work on the determining the dependence of f or Reynolds number and epsilon by d. The prominent among them were Nicoratze, who worked with pipe walls roughed with sand grains of different sizes, Hunter Rouse, a very famous fluid dynamicist, R. J. S. Piggott, Rouse and Piggott worked on developing a, a representation chart of the data. Colebrook, who experimentally developed a correlation of the friction factor with the Reynolds number and epsilon by d. And Lewis Moody, who is credited with putting the work of all these people together into a chart which is famously known as Moody chart or Moody diagram. This is what a Moody chart looks like. Moody charts helps us determine the friction factor f, the Darcy friction factor, as a function of a Reynolds number. with the relative pipe roughness parameter epsilon by d as a parameter. Thus, given a Reynolds number and given a roughness parameter epsilon by d, we can locate a point on the chart and read from the left hand scale the effective friction factor. you would notice a few things. On the left hand side for the Reynolds flow it is a straight line represented by 64 r e. Since it is a log log plot a relation f is equal to 64 by r e would plot as a straight line. This is for laminar flow up to a Reynolds number of about 2000. Then this gray area to something like 3000 is an area which is the transition region and one is not very sure of what the friction factor is in this region. After that, there is turbulent region. And the turbulent region is divided into two portions by this broken line. On the right of the broken line, the flow is called fully turbulent. And you notice that in, re in this region, the value of f is quite independent of the Reynolds number. It depends only on epsilon by d. We'll exploit this fact in solving the problems. To the left of this, 
the flow is not fully turbulent and the friction factor depends both on Reynolds number and epsilon by d. This limiting line is for epsilon by d 0 that is for a smooth pipe. Colebrook developed a formula for Reynolds number greater than 4000 and which is widely used in computer calculation 1 over root f is equal to minus log of epsilon by d divided by 3.7 plus 2.51 divided by Reynolds number based on diameter times root f. There are various online calculators available. One of these calculator is at this address. If you Google search a cold book formula calculator, you will get a number of calculators there. For smooth pipes, the line which was the lowest, the friction factor is given by f is equal to 0 0.184 divided by Reynolds number raised to power 0 0.t. This is valid for the range of Reynolds number between 5 into 10 to the power 5 to 5 into 10 to the power 6. Now, there are two different types of problems in a piping engineer encounters in general. One is the analysis problem and the other is the design problem. In an analysis problem, the piping engineer knows the pipe geometry that is the L, D and epsilon and the fluid properties rho and mu. She is also given one of the following two flow quantities, the flow velocity or the head loss. The other of these two is to be determined. On the other hand, a design problem is one where the diameter of the pipe to carry a given flow rate for a given pressure head loss is to be determined. So, we have to determine what size of pipe we should use to carry a given flow rate with the given pressure difference. The first type of problem, the analysis problem is easier than the second class of problems. There are two kinds of analysis problems. In the first type of analysis problem that is when the velocity or the flow rate through the pipe is given and we have to find out the pressure difference. The process that is used is calculate the flow rate or rather calculate the flow velocity v if v is not given using q dot and d. Once velocity is known, calculate Reynolds number and since the diameter is given, we can calculate epsilon and d. Determine the friction factor from the Moody's chart or from the Colebrook formula or calculator and then using the f using f, v and l by d determine the head loss. We will do an example. A fireman with an 8 centimeter diameter hose directs a jet of water at 60 degrees to the horizontal so as to reach a fire 10 meter above the ground level. If the nozzle and the hose diameters are the same, that is the nozzle is not reducing the flow area and the length of the hose is 30 meters, what should be the head developed by the pump? Assume the equivalent roughness of the hose to be 0 0.008 meters, that is 0 0.8 millimeters. Now, the head required by the pump is for two purposes. 
One is to give the jet of water enough velocity so that it can reach a 10 meter height. And the second part of the head required is to overcome the losses in the 30 meter length of the hose. So, we will first determine the velocity required. Assume no reduction in the cross section in the nozzle, we need to find the velocity of water through the hose. We can determine Vj. Vj is determined by applying the simple kinematic equations to particles of water in the jet region. If it comes out with the velocity Vj as 60 degrees, then a horizontal component Vj cosine 60 degrees and a vertical component Vj sin 60 degrees. During the time the jet rises, the vertical component reduces because of gravitational force downwards and at the top the velocity component in the vertical direction is 0. The horizontal component is unaffected if we neglect the drag in air. The horizontal component to begin with Vj cosine 60 degrees that is Vj by 2. So, the velocity at the upper end is simply Vj by 2, there being no vertical component. So, the velocity is Vj the velocity here is Vj by 2. We can apply Bernoulli equations between these two points. The pressures at the two points are same atmospheric, but there is a difference in, in elevation and that difference in elevation is tail. Applying the Bernoulli equation, we get the jet velocity to be 16 point one seven meters per second. Now, this should be the velocity through the hose. We can calculate the Reynolds number through the hose based on the diameter of the hose which is 80 millimeter, 8 centimeter and this Reynolds number comes out to be 1.29 into 10 to the power 6. And given the epsilon and d, we can find out the roughness parameter, relative roughness parameter as 0 0.01. So, then we can go to Moody chart, enter at the Reynolds number of 1.29 into 10 to the power 6 and go up to the relative pi of 0 0.01 that we determined. And so, that is the point that we reach. And from this, we can read the value of the friction factor as 0 0.038 on this scale. So, the Darcy friction factor for the flow through the hose is 0 0.038. We could also find out the friction factor from the calculators online and we will get the same value. Once we know the value of f, I can calculate the head loss as f times v average square by 2g times l by d and this comes out to 189.9 meters. To determine the total head minus Hs that needs to be developed by the pump negative because this is the work being done on the fluid. 
apply the energy equation between the pump inlet and the nozzle exit and we apply this equation, we find out that the head developed by the pump must be 203.2 meters. To just pump the water 10 meters in height, we need to develop a head of 203 meters. Our calculations are not wrong, but it is too much. So, what should be done? And the solution is simple. Reduce the flow speed because the head loss depends on the square of the velocity through the pipe. So, if we can reduce the velocity through the pipe, but the velocity at the jet must still remain the same. 16.17 meters per second if we have to reach a height of 10 meters. So, how do you reduce the velocity through the, ho through the hose while keeping the jet velocity constant? Is by using a reduction nozzle at the pipe. So, we must reduce the velocity through the hose still keeping the velocity at the jet exit as 16.17 meet 1 point as 16.17 meters per second so that it reaches a height of 10 meters the only way of achieving this is to use a reducing nozzle at the end of the hose if a nozzle of 2.5 centimeter exit diameter is used then the velocity vh in the hose is 1.58 meters per second. So, while the velocity in the jet is still 16.17 meters per second, the velocity within the hose is 1.58 meters per second. The corresponding Reynolds number through the hose is now reduced to 1.26 into 10 to the power 5. Epsilon by d remains unchanged because we have not changed the diameter of the hose. And from the Moody's chart, for the new Reynolds number 1.26 to 10 to the power 5, the point is here. And so, f is unchanged at 0 0.038. But even with this f, the head loss now is a measly 1.81 meters compared to about 192 meters. So, the total head required now is 15.13 meters compared to 203.2 meters without the use of the reducing nozzle. Let us do one more example. The maximum power from a hydroelectric project, a penstock carrying water from a reservoir to a turbine was described earlier. It was shown that in the absence of viscous losses, the maximum power developed by the turbine is when it extracts two thirds of the total head. So, that the maximum power generated is rho a 2 the area of the penstock times 2 g h by 3 raised to power 3 by 2. The curve of non-dimensional velocity versus non-dimensional power was something like this. So, we get a maximum power when two-thirds of the head was extracted and one-third of the head was left with the velocity. Now, determine the maximum power developed in the presence of viscous losses in the penstock. Up till now, we have not taken the viscous losses in the penstock. Penstock is of length L and the average diameter D. 
if we include the effect of viscous losses, the energy equation, which is this, another loss is F V 2 square by 2 times L by D, velocity through the penstock from here to the exit V 2 is the same at V 2. So, we are using this as the head loss, the energy extracted per unit mass throughput is now given as this. The power output is the energy extracted per unit mass throughput times the mass throughput, mass flow rate through the pen stock and this is the expression that we get. If the flow is assumed to be fully turbulent, we can assume F to be constant independent of the Reynolds number and then the maximum power output can be obtained by di differentiating W s dot with, res with respect to V 2 and setting it equal to 0. The corresponding W s turns out to be this, which is 1 divided by under root 1 plus F L by D of the maximum power in the absence of friction. For a concrete pen stock of diameter 1 meter and length 100 meters and epsilon about 1 millimeter for concrete, the value for the fully developed flow is F is equal to 0 0.02. So, that 1 over under the root 1 plus F L by D is 0 0.577. That is the maximum power developed is only 57.7 percent of the ideal power when friction was negligible. So, there is quite a bit of loss of power. Thank you very much.